Good afternoon to all our guests, speakers, and members of the Senate. Cloiso, and welcome to the Engage Change Sharing the Results event here at the Pierhead Building in Cardiff Bay. We would like to thank Vaughan Gethin, who is the Minister for Economy, for sponsoring our event here this afternoon. There is a QR code for those of you who are digitally minded. Um, available for you to scan if you would like to have a digital copy of today's agenda. Yes, we have gone very much 21st century here this afternoon. My name is Gannon John Griffiths. I am the lead ambassador. And if you didn't know, I've got the loudest mouth in Wales. And they have told me to try and keep it short, which isn't always very much the po uh, possible. We have quite a variety of speakers presenting to you this afternoon. But before we get to all of that, I need to firstly go through the housekeeping rules with you. We are not expecting a fire drill, so the near exits are located at Simon. Thank you. Out here, left hand side through the double door. Nice to have a second hand man on the, on, in the pay ahead, isn't it? Toilets, including accessible fertilities, are to my right hand side, and that was your left hand side, through the double doors, turn right. First door you come to will be the accessible toilet. Keep going down the hall, and you reach the gentlemen and the ladies. This, even, this event is being live-streamed. However, the camera will not be facing you, the audience. It will only be facing whoever is speaking on the main stage. They will have difficulty with me, because I've got such a big head. But there we are. We will also be taking photographs today, which will be used by Engage Change and Learning Disability Wales. If you would not like to have your photograph taken, Please make yourself visible to a member of Learn Disability Wales staff who are wearing the red polo shirts. Please give us a wave, guys. Marvellous, you're scattered on the place. Our first speaker is Angela Kenvin, who is the Engaged Change Project Manager and who also happens to have the hardest job of all, line managing me. Angela has a youth and community work background and has managed community-based services and projects for around 25 years. One of these projects which Angela managed was the Real Opportunities Project, which was when I first crossed paths with Angela all those years ago, and you still can't get rid of me. So without further ado, can you please welcome my line manager, also the Engage Change Project Manager, Angela Kenvin. Jock and bow. I need to adjust these, don't I? I'm not as tall as Geraint. There we go. Thanks, Geraint. Thanks very much. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I've had the privilege of managing this amazing project, and I'm going to give you a short overview to set the scene for today's event. I was recently asked about where the project came from and how did these particular organisations come together as a partnership? A valid question that made me realise we, we very, very rarely mention this. Quite a number of years ago, I developed to manage a project called Real Opportunities Transition to Employment. Led by Caerphilly County Borough Council, it was delivered across eight local authorities in South Wales and finished in 2014. That project not only demonstrated what works in transition, but also identified a real need for individualised employment support for people with learning disabilities and or autism who wish to get a paid job. Of course, this wasn't anything new. There have been plenty of schemes and research across the UK and wider that identified the very same. What Real Opportunities did was to lay the foundations for Engage to Change. When Real Opportunities ended, three of the organisations who'd been involved in delivery came together to see what could be done. After setting up a consortium, writing a project plan and securing funding, Engage to Change started in 2016. Engage to Change was a Pan Wales employment project funded by the National Lottery Community Fund in partnership with the Welsh Government. The project supported young people aged 16 to 25 years who have a learning difficulty, learning disability and or autism and who were NEAT, that is not in employment, education or training, or who were at risk of becoming NEAT. Led by Learning Disability Wales, the project was delivered by a partnership of organisations, including Cardiff University's National Centre for Mental Health, a Coriad and Elite Supported Employment Agencies, and All Wales People First. 
Engage to Change worked in collaboration with DFM Project Search, further education colleges, local authorities, health boards and businesses across Wales. After securing several extensions, the project finally stopped delivering support to young people on the 31st of May this year. So what did we actually do? In brief, taking an individualised approach, engage to change work closely with the young person, their parents, carers and employers to overcome barriers to employment, develop skills, provide unpaid work experience, paid supported employment, volunteering opportunities and access to supported internships, traineeships and apprenticeships. We aim to demonstrate to employers the valuable contribution that these young people can make to the workplace and to influence recruitment practices to make them more accessible and to make the workforce more diverse. 746 employers across Wales offered work preparation opportunities such as mock interviews, workplace visits and unpaid placements, while 410 provided paid placements. We also had three health boards, one university, one local authority and several smaller employers take the role of host business for the supported internships. Engage to Change has recently awarded 16 employers across Wales for their outstanding work. Photos, names of employers and awards are included in one of the films being shown today. I'm not going to give information about the extensive data that was collected and outcomes, as we'll be hearing that detail from Dr Steve Bayer. But what I will say is that a paid employment of 41% across the main project and the supported internships is exceptionally good. When compared with 4.8% of adults with learning disabilities and 21.7% of autistic people in employment across the UK. Over the last few months, we've published a series of evaluation reports authored by our research and evaluation partners at NCMH that are available on the Engage to Change website. Additional reports will be forthcoming. Engage to Change partners set out to influence practice and policy in areas such as disability and youth employment, work-based learning and further education. As such, we've been working with the Welsh Government and other key organisations across Wales. As a partnership, we also responded to relevant UK Government, Welsh Government and DWP consultations. As a collective, we have many years of experience in the fields of learning disability, education and supported employment. However, through proactive, ongoing evaluation of the project, we set out to evidence that job coach support and supported employment work, with the hope that after Engage to Change has finished, this support would become core funded and made available to all of those who need it. So how far have we got? Engage to Change introduced supported internships to Wales. There weren't any before the project. With the introduction in 2021 of the new independent living skills curriculum delivered by FE colleges across Wales came pathway for supported internships. Funded by Welsh Government, every college in Wales now has one or more supported internship programmes running in partnership with host businesses and many but not all with supported employment agencies. We've worked with Collegae Cymru Pathway 4 Working Group to develop quality standards and guidelines for colleges to use. Our call for a national job coaching service, funded by Welsh Government, resulted in many meetings with key civil servants, members of the Senate and a meeting with Minister for Economy Vaughan Gething. Engaged to change piloted job coach support for traineeships with job coach support then becoming available through the Jobs Growth Wales Plus programme launched last year. This is continuing in 2024 to 25 and hopefully will remain to be part of that programme in the future. The project also piloted supported apprenticeships with job coach support, which led to a supported shared apprenticeship programme being developed, funded by Welsh Government. Both are continuing to be offered for 2023 to 24, and it is hoped they will be thereafter. The Welsh Government Employability and Skills Plan launched last year states that in future Welsh Government will take forward activity to improve access to and outcomes on our employability programme for people with significant learning disabilities by providing specialist intensive job coach support. The transition to employment report that Dr Heffin David MS will talk about later features engaged to change as a good practice model and makes the recommendation that 
The Welsh Government should review support for job coaching for those transitional learners with additional learning needs who request it. With reference to the good practice developed by Engage to Change in Learning Disability Wales, an ALN job coaching strategy should be prepared, expanding the provision of specialist coaches to support learners with ALN to gain paid employment. However, we are not stopping there. Learning Disability Wales and NCMH at Cardiff University have secured funding to carry on working on behalf of people with learning disabilities on our influencing policy agenda. We will continue to work with Elite and other key organisations, including Welsh Government, with the aim of ensuring that people of all ages who have learning disabilities and or autism can access the support they need to gain and sustain employment. What we also need to do is to raise awareness of the programmes and support available to people with learning disabilities, their families and people that work and support them. We recently launched Engage to Change Pathway to Employment videos that are freely available for anyone to use. Featuring young people and employers from the project, they can be found on the project YouTube channel and via the Q code on the, Q code on the business cards being handed out today. Careers Wales have also added the links to their website. It's a careful balancing act because in order to provide an increase in quality employment support, there must be enough job coaches employed and trained in supported employment and systematic instruction. Job coaching needs to be recognised as a profession as teaching and youth work are. We are asking for Welsh Government, DWP and public bodies in Wales to work together to ensure this support is funded and available. On behalf of Engage to Change, I'd like to thank Welsh Government colleagues, in particular from Disabled People's Employment, Employment Policy, Further Education Apprenticeship, for working with us and taking the project's ideas forward. More importantly, much, much more importantly, I'd like to give huge thanks to the young people, the families and employers for giving the project a chance, not forgetting the project staff. Your achievements have been absolutely amazing, and without all of you, none of this would have happened. So thank you. Give yourselves a big clap. <laughs> So I think I've talked enough now. I'm going to hand you back to Geraint, I think, very briefly, Geraint. Yeah? Thanks very much. Thank you, Angela. I just wanted to pick on a couple of things which you mentioned. First of all, the importance on this project. I know Dr. Steve Bear will go into the um, statistics, but I've been involved with the project since the very start, back in 2016. The goals we set were ambitious, but we never in a million thought that the impact of engaged changes had would have happened back then. And again, that's only down to the project partners, including Elite, Agoriad, um, Cardiff University and Learning Disability Wales, and also to the young people, because without you and the support from your friends and family would not have been possible. Right, slightly moving on, our next speaker is Dr. Stephen Bayer. Steve is a senior lecturer at the School of Medicine at Cardiff University. In the last year, I have been working closely with Steve and along with his colleagues, Andrea Meek and Dr. Elisa Vinya. I've been bombarding them with emails in the last few weeks. We are working together to make our paper report with regards to employment and quite recently, making the inclusion and equality at work more accessible and more inclusive to all. So without further ado, please welcome Stock Dr. Stephen Bayer, who will share our learning from the Engage Change Project. Jock and Bowd. Thank you, Gerard. And um, good afternoon, everyone. I've had the privilege of leading the evaluation team for seven years now, um, embedded, I think, within the project with our colleagues from uh, Elite and some of the other organisations collecting information on this massive project. So it's too much to share it all today, but we'll give you a, a, an insight into some of the things that we have been looking at. Next slide. So um, evaluation clearly tries to find out what works, how things can be improved, and in this case, how more young people with learning disabilities, with specific learning difficulties, or autistic young people can find jobs. Um, Angela touched on the model called supported employment, which it's important to recognise wasn't new. 
I mean, this model was developed in the United States in the 1980s, and it came to um, the UK and to Wales, um, you know, not, not, not that long after, in the late, in the late 1980s. And um, there were certainly projects in Swansea, and there have been projects in Wales ever since then, um, you know, with the support of um, organisations like our Partners Elite and, uh, um, and Agoriad. Um, however, supported employment in the country as a whole and in Wales has been what you might call had a jigsaw puzzle of funding where people have fought for different bits of European funding and other funding to keep it going. And it hasn't generally been defined, nor has it been funded um, nationally in the UK or Wales. And there's a whole context um, in the UK and Wales that isn't in the United States where a lot of the evidence comes from in terms of our welfare benefit system, the way that we, we're, we're organised, our services are organised. So clearly there were things to check and test in this project across Wales. Next slide. So most projects have got questions that they want to answer. These were broadly what, what we were looking at. Um, top left. Yeah, top left. Um, did all groups of young people have equal access to the project? So we were looking at the diagnosis of people coming in. Um, we were checking, um, tracking jobs to see who got jobs and to see um, which groups got access to jobs and whether that was equal and fair. Um, did more jobs get through supported employment and job coaching than, than elsewhere? And I guess the big question here is compared to what? We didn't have the luxury of comparing with other um, services, but there are um, some national statistics, I think, that Angela's touched on that we can look at later on to see whether it, whether it worked well or not. Again, we were describing people tracking jobs and tracking placements here. Um, I think, importantly, were the jobs real and worth having? Um, so for that, we were looking at whether the hours were decent hours, whether the pay was decent and, um, to national levels. Were people being socially included and were their skills developing um, over time as they went through the programme? And also, um, did people's, this kind of intersectionality idea, did young people's gender, ethnicity, age and some of their past experiences impact on who got jobs and who didn't? Uh, there, again, we had to describe people and also look at previous work experiences and some of the other experiences people had had before. Uh, next slide. Um, I think, crucially, did the supported employment uh, model work for young people and their families? Because we know that for this particular group of young people, families are absolutely key to their independence and key to their taking up opportunities like employment. So there we interviewed um, families and young people and we offered online surveys where people could respond independently. Um, did supported internships work for young people and employers? It was a, an important and a new intervention in Wales. So we did survey those interns, those young people who went into supported internship. We surveyed employers. And also we surveyed workplace mentors, co-workers, because they were, in that model, a very key part of the, the success of individuals in supported internship. And um, finally, we also looked at what works in how supported employment is delivered. Um, we looked at pathways to jobs, so some people went straight into employment, some went through unpaid placements, some went through paid placements. There are another, a number of ways people would get into employment. We looked at the hours of job coach, job coach input and um, the type of help that job coaches were providing people under this model to see you know, what was working there. And we also talked extensively with job coaches about their experience themselves of delivering it and how that changed over, we have to remember, a really interesting and challenging period with COVID-19, where everything was thrown up in the air and it all had to be held, catered for and rebuilt afterwards with actually a different set of challenges emerging after COVID, different kind of work uh, challenges than we had before. Next slide, please. So, um, what do we find? And as Angela said, there's reports, and there will be more reports on the Engage to Change website. So in terms of quality, while there were efforts made to get equal referrals, in the end, 70% of those who were eligible for the project, joining the project, were men. Now, we found this before in employment projects for people with learning disabilities, that there's a real bias for men 
going into employment and women not. You know, it hasn't really been, you know, investigated enough to find out, but it's certainly culturally um, and practically there are issues that women face to get into work that men don't seem to. Um, so that's a challenge, I think. Um, the um, diagram there breaks this, the referrals down by the diagnosis. So you can see the blue bar, 52%, a slight majority uh, of people who were referred to the project had autism of some kind. Um, the next was people with learning disabilities um, at 45%, just under half. And then people with the other client group specific um, learning difficulties were 41%. But there was quite a mix of people with different diagnoses and different challenges. Um, and you can see at the top there, the green shows, for example, people with learning disabilities and who are autistic. And that was 19% of the client group. Um, and I think the degree to people had overlapping traits and conditions were quite important because some of that created complex challenges for the team who were trying to place people into employment. It wasn't straightforward. As Angela said, the overall project employment rate was 41%. Um, and we'll look at that in context uh, in um, a moment. Next slide. So looking at who got a job, was there equality there? Well, um, the highest rates were for people who were young people who were autistic, with one out of three people referred in that, with that diagnosis getting a job. Um, for people with learning disabilities, one out of three and a half. And for people with learning disabilities and who were autistic, 1.43. Now, go back one. What, what that tells us, I think, is for me, the um, figures for young people who are autistic and those with learning disabilities um, are different, but not so much, but lower for those who had both, which suggests that it was slightly more difficult to get people through the model into employment. Next. Um, obviously, the key here is compared to what? And Angela's already said that we can compare it to 4.8% um, of adults with learning disabilities in employment. That's an English figure. We don't have one for Wales, and that's a real barrier. We don't know how many people with learning disabilities or autism are in employment in Wales. And if we're going to move forward, we need to know that so we can see how we're having an impact on it. But the other thing to look at with that 41% is how it relates to um, people all people with disabilities and all the general population. There's still a huge gap, even with that 41%, between the 76% of non-disabled people who are employed nationally and also the 54% of disabled people who were um, um, uh, also employed. Um, there remains work to be done, I think, to persuade young people that employment is in their best interest and to also to raise the percentage of those people who come to us that actually get into employment. Uh, next overhead, please. So what was the impact of age? <clears throat> um, as Angela said, the project worked with people who were 16 to 25. Um, and as you can see, the red figures here, um, those who were a little younger were more likely to be referred than those who were at the older end of the, of the cohort. Next slide. Now, if you look at the green figure, even though they were not referred in the same numbers as um, younger people, the employment rate was higher for those who were older, which I think is very interesting. Um, why? Well, you know, as far as we know, it could well be that older young people, if I can call it that, have a better idea of what they want to do uh, in a job or are, are more mature with more experience relevant to a job which may make it, make it easier to find them a job. In other words, the shorthand is nearer to the jobs market. Um, if we look at the next slide, this figure of 15% for the young, the very young people, this is those who came forward and were referred, um, is, is worrying, I think. They have the lowest levels, and I think this has implications for so supporting young people in transition 
uh, in that younger age while they're still at school and before almost they enter, they enter colleges. We know a lot of people with learning disabilities in particular choose to stay on in school, you know, 18, 19 years old. But there are a lot of people who express an interest in actually going into work rather than staying in, into education. And it looks as though we don't do very well with that group at the moment. And some of the reasons and some of the things we might be able to do with that comes out of the rest of the data. Um, can we move on? Next slide. Um, we found this interesting, the impact of previous work experience. A very high number of people had had some form of work experience in the past, 84%. And that could have been um, a short-term placement, volunteering, even having had a job before. But we were intrigued to find that the employment rate for those who had had previous work experience of any kind was 25%, compared with only three. So even though they had the same access to supported employment, they still seem to be doing better with that model than those who didn't have that, that experience. I think it's important to say that we can't be sure of the quality of that work experience. You know, we have no information about how long or how, how well it operated. But what we do know is that those people were not employed when they came to the project because they would not have been eligible otherwise. So whatever it was, it didn't actually get them a long-term uh, job. Next slide. We also looked, this is this diagram here, we looked at the number of placements that people had, and it goes from none through to four placements. And as you can see, the grey bar is the percentage of people who were employed. And that goes up in the sense that the more opportunities people had had in the past, the higher the percentage employment rate that they had uh, within the project. Um, and I think that in itself is, is also very interesting and leads us to say that previous work experience with supported employment input seems to be an effective mix, although it's important to say people without previous experience still got jobs through the model as well. Next slide. Um, supported, this is a bit text heavy, sorry about that, but um, the summary is, it's difficult to say how important the supported employment schemes within the project were. Um, you know, they, we did get money uh, that came to Wales from, from DWP centrally through access to work to pay for some of this. Um, they were new to the area and we were able for over a few years to experiment with them, which I think did inform some of the decision making around introducing the, um, the pathway for um, funding. Um, over half, so there was a higher representation here of people with learning disabilities in these schemes than, than the other groups. Um, but again, 50% of people had more than one condition. So there's a lot of complexity going on here for people. 77% <clears throat> had had previous work experience, quite high, not as the same as the average for the whole scheme. But we did know there that they were quite um, small in, uh, in content. Two weeks or less, unpaid, usually facilitated by a school and a college, not by a supported employment agency. Um, but we did get really good feedback from, um, from the young people themselves who reported that the training they got, the job coach support, the communication, the mentor support from their co-workers um, were, were, were all rated as very good. Um, and there, the overall average average rate was 36% of uh, people employed. That's after a year in a placement, which again is good. But there was a great difference, which, sorry, <laughs> There's a great difference in that over the years and the schemes, and they all started at different times, that's difficult to compare like with like, but we did have a rate that ran from 80% one year to 7% another for new schemes operating. So this can actually give you very high rates of output. And um, we did have two models operating. One was the project search model, another one was the alternative support with internships. All did good work. Alternative support with employment internships came later in the project and, you know, still building, but the, they're between 47 and 13% for the do, two different models. There's still things to learn, I think, about how those schemes operate. Next slide, please. Um, the project did offer paid placements, which is unusual in support with employment. They don't normally have the ability to pay wages. They could pay... Um, to remind you, they could pay 100% of wages up to six months, but more often it was tapered so that 
over time that wage subsidy uh, went down so that the person was being paid by the employer at the end of the placement. Um, 43% of the relevant people referred to the project took up one of those placements. So it was an important element of the, of the, um, of the scheme. And of those who went for the paid placement, 45% were employed at the end of it, compared with 19% of people who didn't go through those paid placements. So clearly, a really important tool in the, um, in the armoury of the Engage to Change project. We also put those together with the supported internship people to look at those who had a significant work experience, defined as six months in a paid placement or you know, the six to nine months, whatever it was, in supported internship. And then again, we saw that all of that led to a higher rate of employment. If you had a substantial, a significant um, work experience, then 39% were employed compared with 17 who didn't. So our finding there, I guess, is that significant, and I emphasise significant previous experience, appears to be a strongly relevant factor in determining outcomes of paid employment for people with these, um, these diagnoses. Next slide, please. Now, were the jobs real and worth having? In other words, were they funny jobs that people actually created? Were they sheltered jobs? Were they jobs that other people wouldn't have got? Um, um, and were they worth having? In other words, did they pay real wages and, and, and were they good hours? Well, the answer to that is yes. If you look at the diagram there on the left, it shows the number of hours in categories that the young people worked. And over half, 55%, worked over 16 hours a week. I mean, that used to be kind of a big you know, threshold. It isn't so much now with universal credit. But it's still an interesting indicator of, of you know, good levels of work, um, work engagement. Um, the, interestingly, the wages delivered were 18% above the living wage, not the national minimum wage. And that, that's taken into account that those living wages have got different ratings by age. Um, and overall, the wage rates were the same for men and women in the programme and also between the different disabilities that we've actually described. So a fairly equal basis for those. Um, next slide, please. When people went into jobs, the job coaches who provided lots of this data and worked really hard getting this material provided us with, uh, answered a lot of questions about the workplaces so we could see whether they were what you might call ordinary workplaces or th where things have been done differently. So what you can see here is, is three columns. One, uh, and on the left it says one to seven. Seven means that the arrangements are very typical of uh, any other worker in that workplace. And the, um, the lower ones uh, down to one would mean they were completely atypical. So you can see that for initial training, workplace behaviour, the kind of work that people were, were doing was largely the same. We had a high typicalness value. So they're largely doing the same work as other people. And the participation, which in meant things like being involved in the normal process of HR, management, all of those kind of things, were also fairly typical for the people who went in. Where it was different was for finding a job, getting an interview, getting into that job, where it was tending towards the atypical, particularly for women, the application and the interview pro, 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 um, process. Now, we think that reflects reasonable adjustments on the part of the, uh, of the employer. Things like um, direct negotiation instead of going through adverts you know, with, with an employer, maybe even working interviews instead of um, you know, panel interviews. So you know, we're, we're, we're seeing that as a positive, um, a positive change. But we've seen in other data from other studies that sometimes the more different the way you go into the job, the more different the job you have, the less wages you have and the less hours that you work. In other words, your job becomes atypical. But here, we found a little bit that there were more hours for people who, whose um, jobs were, were more typical, but not a difference in um, average hourly rate. So it didn't mean that the more you modified a job, the, the, the less wages that you earned, which we were encouraged by. Um, next slide, please. Um, also, on the left here, we, look, we asked people about their level of social inclusion in work. And we were really pleased to see that 48% of um, young people reported they had frequent and ongoing interactions at work, which is what you want. Very few had no interaction with people. 
we split it on the right by people who had uh, people, autistic young people and people with learning disabilities. The, uh, the red is people who are autistic. And here you found that the tendency was for people to have less social interaction if they were autistic. Now, of course, that could be partly the way of things with people with autism. But it's also a challenge, I think, for um, employment support agencies to make sure that people... Um, we do as much work as we can to make sure that people take the most advantage of social inclusion in the workplace. Next slide. Of course, we asked young people um, to give us feedback about the project as a whole um, and what they were helped with. Nearly 90% said they had more confidence at the end of it. Over a third were more able to speak up for themselves. And around a third, the ones at the bottom, um, were signs of independence in travel and in their, their lives in general. So a bit of a, a, an effect on people's lives more generally than just the workplace. This actually is, is having an impact on people's lives more generally. So let's wind up. Next slide. Our conclusions are that young people with learning disabilities, autism and specific learning difficulties can work with the right needs-led support at higher levels than is currently available. Supported employment works for this group. Job coaching works for this group. Supported employment and job coaching are key to these kind of results. Previous work experience increases the chance that young people will get a job under supported employment. Paid placements also increase that job chance. So these are additional tools in our armory. Next slide. Um, these young people who we're worried about, I think, 16 to 19 are less likely to go through um, into a job with supported employment. Many stay longer, which limits access. Work experience while at school facilitated by supported employment may increase that chance. And we would like to see more of that as they transition to adulthood. Um, supported internship is also a successful transition to employment model. And lessons from that success, I think, should be learned and used um, in schools um, uh, to get people involved in the labour market earlier. And we have opportunities to do that. We'll hear more about that from Heaven later. Um, and also we need to tackle this young people. And probably we haven't mentioned it, but people from ethnic minorities being underrepresented in, um, in the referrals and also the, therefore the jobs. We need to work on that and find more about what we have to do culturally and practically. Uh, next slide. Remaining challenges, and there are some. This is not, you know... This is not the end of it. We know that supportive, supported internship is an effective model, helping people, young people, to um, get into jobs, and we're now seeing funding throughout Wales. But we have to remember that the success of it within Engage to Change was built on the partnerships between college educators, supported employment, and employers. And quality standards for the new funding sorry, the quality standards for the schemes and also the funding should promote partnership provision because that's where you will get the results that we found, I think. Next slide. Um, we've seen, as Angela told us, job coaching introduced in supported and shared supported apprenticeships, supported traineeships and supported internships. Um, you know, in, in not least uh, Heaven David's report, there's been a call for job coaching we desperately need a strategy for the provision of supported employment and job coaches in Wales to help young people build work experience and to access apprenticeship and supported internships if we're going to move forward. And while we've made major progress with the help of Welsh Government, there's still that uh, has got to be cracked. Final slide. There's a lot of schemes out there for nationally, in Wales, you know, apprenticeships, React Plus, all of these schemes, with new ones coming down the turnpike. Again, we desperately need an effective joint funding mechanism between DWP, Welsh Government, local authorities and other stakeholders to ensure that job coaching and supported employment are available to everyone who needs it. And I think that should be on the agenda of Welsh Government as well. Next slide. I'd like to thank the team who are here. Andrew, Amika, Lisa, Vinya and Jacob Meehan who've ploughed through this material relentlessly for seven years and made the lives of various staff colleagues in, in the Elite and elsewhere in Agoriad hell trying to get the material together. Thank you to them. And there will be more reports coming out and you can find the other ones in the final slide which is social media 
um, opportunities. Last slide. There. You can pick up material and watch that because there will be more material coming out. I'm overrun by minutes. My apologies. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, for your very thorough presentation on the latest figures and statistics on the project. And I would also like to thank all the NCMH team as well for all their numbers and Excel headaches for the seven years. Thank you all. Um, Angela mentioned about the legacy videos um, earlier on, and I've got the privilege to actually show you, not me because I'm technically here, but we have got a taster of the project's legacy videos for you to enjoy and you can also access these on our YouTube sites as well. Talk about it. Everybody needs help and support. Thomas just needs help and support to enable him to do the job, whether it's making a reasonable adjustment for him to drive the Toro, to put a ball on there to enable him. That's what it's all about, it's enabling people, isn't it? He's a visual learner. I am a visual learner. And that's what he is. And I understood that very early on. But everybody is capable as long as they're given the right tools to do the job. Anyway, from nine or ten years ago when I first started, the attitude towards all employees has certainly progressed with the likes of Tom joining us as well. Having that understanding of how to help him also helps understanding of how to help everybody else as well. And I think the company itself, making that progression, is only a benefit, absolutely. Working with Tom, it's been an absolute delight. From the really quiet person that he was when I first met him, and to see him evolve over time, to a confident person that he is right now, it's quite a proud moment, it really, really is. Because it's not just him working in the kitchen, it's him developing as a person as well. And I find that quite important for all my employees. Some of the jobs are just Fionn's responsibility. Some things we do together, so we're sharing the tasks between us. And then other tasks are things that I ask Fionn to do, depending on the workload of the particular day. And actually, I, I don't work on a Thursday, so when she's in here on a Thursday, she's on her own all day. That was a very short extract of our legacy video series. We will show you another one later on, and I will give you de details later about how and where to see the full length films. Our next speaker is the Welsh Director for the National Lottery Community Fund. He is also accountable for the development, delivery and communication of the National Lottery Community Fund's operations here in Wales. Oh, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong one. Apologies. Thank you, dear. Right, our next speaker, ignore that, um, is Dr. Heffin David, um, who is the member of the Senedd. Apologies, Heffin. Heffin's interest as a member of the Senedd are in the area of small firm development and growth, employment and employability, access to further and higher education for those with additional learning needs and the development of values communications. He is also interested in housing, including freehold and leasehold reform, and of the planning system. 
He is also interested to the long-term effects of coronavirus, also known as long COVID, on individuals. So please give a warm welcome to Dr. Heaven David, Member of the Senate. Geraint's been reading my Wikipedia page. Um, I actually thought I was after John, so I think Geraint had it right there, but there we are. You know, you're not going to question it. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, having David at Vienuwi, I love our Senev, Dros Garfili. My engagement change with Igonaid Gwaith and Hagoil, Ruiv Wedi Gwell Dros of Vahin, Sit My Pobli Van Gwedi Kai Like Hevnogi Waith. I've seen personally, as member of the Senate for Caffili, people being helped into work by Engage to Change. Um, I first came across the project in, I think we've just agreed, Stephen, in 2018, uh, when I visited uh, Ian in my constituency. He was working in uh, the co-op in Tri Thomas, uh, supported by Engage to Change. Stephen Bayer came to my office and we had a long conversation about what was going on. But for me, it's actually quite personal because well, I've been interested in autism since I was first elected in 2016. Um, I had a vague idea that autism was in my family. I won't go into detail on that, but a vague idea that it was in my family. And then my daughter came along in 2015 and she was diagnosed with autism at the age of three uh, in, uh, I think it was 2017, 2018. Uh, and uh, it, it was quite a, a, a profound moment for me and my family to recognize that. She's got very powerful additional learning needs, very strong additional learning needs, and she's currently uh, been educated at the age of eight in a, a resource base attached to Estreth Primary uh, in Blina. They do some fantastic work with her. Um, and I am in awe of the support that teachers and carers and the health service give to, to those children. But as a parent, you naturally start thinking to the future and you think about how will my child develop to be an adult? What is it gonna be like when she's 16, 17, 18? There's a gap there. And that gap is being filled by Engage to Change and the project that's being run. I've visited them at Cardiff University and I've seen some of the fantastic work. I've seen uh, young people in placements, uh, supported uh, placements, people who are in full-time work as a result of the project. And I am proud to have just that small association, a small association with Engage to Change uh, that began uh, six years ago. And therefore, it was my honor to include in Engage to Change uh, as a case study in the report that I wrote for the Welsh Government in June of this year. The report is entitled Pontio Vid Gwaith, Transitions to Employment or Bridges to the World of Work. Transitions to Employment in English. Um, and it contains a series of recommendations that I think the Welsh Government should follow in, in order to improve the experience of young people when transitioning to the world of work. And I'm gonna draw your attention to recommendation eight because recommendation eight was built around, very much around, Engage to Change. Uh, Stephen mentioned it earlier. Um, and I couldn't have prepared recommendation eight without the support of Angela Kenvin. Uh, who has been brilliant, and I can see Andrea, and I can see Geraint as well here, uh, who also gave me advice on how I should shape this report. So this recommendation eight was shaped by Engage to Change. I'm just going to read it to you. Uh, so it says, Delay Llywodraeth Cymru, a delegi cymroth ar gyfer hyfforddiant mewn swydd ar gyfer y dysgwr hynny ag additional learning needs sydd yn y broses o bontio ac yn ofyn uh, am a uh, cyfru gamorth. Uh, in English, the Welsh Government should review support for job coaching for those transitional learners with additional learning needs who request it. I would like to have gone further and said all uh, additional learning needs st uh, um, students and, and young people, but I think I have to work within the existing framework and you know that, that uh, money is very tight at the moment. So focusing on those who request it was, was, uh, was put in uh, quite late in the process. But I also said, with reference to the good practice developed by Engage to Change and Learning Disability Wales, an ALN job coaching strategy should be prepared, expanding the provision of specialist coaches to support learners with ALN to gain employment. I think this is what the Welsh Government should be doing. And in fact, we spoke almost of a national job coaching service. 
um, specifically to start with for additional learning needs. But one of the things Angela said to me, there's no reason why this couldn't be broadened out for everyone um, as it would be effective. I think the resources aren't there for everyone at the moment, but certainly there can be that job coaching service that, that can be um, uh, put on a statutory basis for people uh, and supporting them into work. And I think that is something the Welsh Government can do. This report I published in June is on the Welsh Government's website if you want to look for it. Uh, just type in uh, Hevin David, not Kevin, Hevin, H-E-F-I-N. Uh, surname David, first name's not David either. Uh, Hevin David, Transitions to Employment, and you should be able to find it on Google. And in the report, you'll see some of the recommendations I've made. And that is your opportunity to hold the Welsh Government to account for it. Because we debated it in the Senedd, and I know that... Uh, I think it was uh, Geraint and Andrew were there to see us debating this in the Senate, and I gave them a special mention, because this is your opportunity now to say, well, look, you debated this in July, maybe in three or four months' time. What's your progress? What progress has the Welsh Government made on this? Um, you may or may not know, I'm not a member of the Welsh Government. I'm a backbencher. I'm one of the ones who causes all the trouble, um, and I quite enjoy that. Um, but it also my, it's also my job to put pressure on Welsh Government to get things done. So here is your opportunity. Here is your opportunity to say to Welsh Government, look, recommendation eight, where are we? What progress has been made? Um, I'll be continuing that dialogue, won't I? Um, and we'll be going back to the Minister, to Jeremy Miles, the Minister for Education, to Julie Morgan, the Minister for Social Services, and we'll be pressing, pressing these things to them to see what progress they've made. There were some other recommendations I do want to point to you while we, we're here, because recommendation one, uh, said that learners should be, rec should be provided with authentic and meaningful experiences of the world of work supported by the new curriculum for Wales provision. I know that um, Ian Elliott, who's just finished as head teacher of Trinity School, excellent head teacher, has said the curriculum for Wales offers new dimensions for the teaching uh, of uh, additional learning needs students. And Welsh Government should ensure that further education institutions, employers and other stakeholders have access to learners. And that's one of the things we're finding is that often, particularly those with additional learning needs, don't even come across employers and other institutions until they've finished their employment. Well, that needs to happen earlier. I've also said that learners need full clarity on what options are available to them in future. So if you're 11 years old, you know, when my Caitlin is, you know, is, is, is starting comp, I want to, I suspect she'll be in a special needs school, but I still want her to have the opportunity to think about what opportunities will be available to her, just as, as, as any other child would have uh, when she reaches the age of 16 or 18, when she decides to, to, to enter the world of work. Um, and I also said, recommendation four, Welsh Government should ensure that an offer of a meaningful work experience, pl experience placement is made available to all learners aged 14 to 18 in Wales. This offer should include a supported, targeted offer of tailored work experience for key stage four learners who are disengaging with education or at risk of becoming neat. I think we need to go back to the days of work experience, but not in the way it used to be provided. I think we need to look at what students want to do, whether they want to do work experience, and those that do should have the opportunity. And I think we need to look back at that and improve it and get better. Um, we also, and recommendation five says, work experience placement should be matched as closely as possible to a learner's interest and skills and arranged with reference to the learner's potential to uh, pathway to potential future qualifications in employment and should also consider the local labour market utilising local intelligence and the expertise of regional skills partnerships. By local intelligence, I mean everyone in this room needs to have a say on how that develops. And I think the reason this report is written, uh, the fact it exists suggests we're not there yet, doesn't it? It suggests we've got a way to go. This is on the record. It's on the Welsh Government's website. It was commissioned by the minister, Jeremy Miles, the education minister. So it's very much a living document. I'm not intending to write it and forget about it. And I'm not going to let the Welsh Government forget about it because we need to come back to it. We need to review it. I've said in six months' time, I'll be asking for a debate on it in the chamber again. In a year's time, I'll be asking what actions have been carried out, what progress has been made, and I'll be maintaining my dialogue with Engage to Change about that progress. And you guys know that I'm here to speak to you anytime you want. Um, some of you DM me on Twitter, some of you send text messages, some of you send emails. Um, I'm here to talk. 
and I'm here to keep those lines of dialogue open with the Welsh Government. My vision for the future is to see what has happened with so many people in this room it happens more with more people, with more people with additional learning needs, and that they have the opportunities to find that meaningful work that has been found by the cohorts that Stephen mentioned in his presentation. I think there's a real big opportunity there, and I hope as a result, and everything, all politics is personal, hope as a result that my Caitlin and children like her will have that hope when they reach the age where they are ready to go into employment. That is what you are offering the world today, and I'm incredibly proud to stand with you. But most importantly, all I want to say to everyone in this room, from the bottom of my heart, is thank you. I would like to wish my personal deepest thanks. Heaven, the um, effort you put into our report um, has not gone unnoticed, and we appreciate everything um, that you've come when you come to Cardiff. You need to speak to the um, internship students there. And when you were talking about what young people want as learners, um, Andrea and Lee's one of the memories. We went to a um, workshop, we a workshop we did along with Tom, who was in the video earlier. And we asked some young people, what, what's your dream job? What do you want to do? And a lot of them said, well, we don't know. We've never been asked. And this is where it's so important to engage with these young people, engage with these learners, and ask them, what do you want? Because at the end of the day, it's all about the young people. And when we went to see your report debated in the Senate, it was quite great to see you there as well. Because um, I was wearing like a mad lunatic through the viewing gallery. Hi, heaven! Um, <laughs> so it was, quite, it was quite a lovely moment. Right, the next speaker, I am going to get it right this time, John. I do apologise. I'm getting on a bit now, I'm cacking on 28 now. <laughs> Our next speaker is John Rose Obihi, who is the Welsh Director for the National Lottery Community Fund. John is accountable for the development, delivery and communication of the National Lottery Community Fund's operations here in Wales, as well as, le as, well as leading. He has spent five years working on the Landfill Tax Community Fund, managing operations in Wales also, as long in the Midlands and southwest of England, before joining the National Lottery Community Fund back in 2003. Later on in 2022, John was awarded an OBE in the New Year's Honours List in recognition of his contribution to civil society. So without further ado, please give a warm, warm welcome to John Rose, OBE. Thank you, Geraint. Um, that reminded me of quite how old I am when you go through what I've been doing over the years as well. Um, good afternoon. Fantastic to be here. Um, I'm just going to say a little bit about uh, why we funded this project um, and a little bit about that partnership, actually, and, and talk about that a bit. Um, so my name's John Rose. Yeah, I'm Director of, of National Lottery Community Fund in Wales. Um, as well as distributing National Lottery Funds, uh, we also look after a pot of funds from something called the Dormant Account Scheme, uh, and that was what's allowed us to actually fund Engage to Change over the last eight years or so. Um, Dormant Account Scheme has, has, uh, has basically mobilised money in uh, bank and building society accounts that haven't been accessed for over 15 years and allows it to be put to good use for good causes and good projects like Engage to Change. Uh, the scheme's currently being looked at to expand it and bring other financial products in, uh, so we'd be hopeful that further funds will be forthcoming in the future uh, for various spending purposes. Um, so really over the last eight, well, ten years or so, um, we've actually awarded around £28 million to projects through the Dormant Accounts Fund. Um, but it's delighted to say that Engage to Change is, um, other than one endowment we've given, the, the largest single award that we've given for a project. Um, so over eight years it's now just short of £12 million. Uh, and it was an absolute pleasure actually to listen to all the speakers so far. Um, but I thought Stephen gave a uh, fantastic insight into the achievements of the project over that period of time and some outstanding success figures uh, when you compare them to not just the supported employment but other employment programmes in general. Um, so congratulations. Um, as I said, the, a lot's been said about the project. Um, I just want to say a little bit about the partnership. Uh, partnership is going to become increasingly important as we go forward. 
Kevin mentioned that these are tough times financially. So actually thinking about how organisations work together really for the benefit of the people that they serve is going to be really, really vital. Um, and it's the partnership element, I think, of this project which has stood out to us as exceptional. A um, bit of insight into this. So um, in the audience today is my colleague Gemma, who's supported this project over a number of years now. Gemma's pretty hard-nosed, it has to be said. But she said to me this morning when we were talking about this, she goes, I'm not, I'm not supposed to have favourites, but over the years this is my favourite project in terms of the impact it's had. Um, and in particular, I think, working with the partners that have done so. Um, so, yeah, a big shout out really to, obviously, Learning Disability Wales, who have led on this project for, for bringing the partnership together and actually holding those reins uh, and the ongoing work they've had around influencing and voice. Um, they've clearly been very successful with you, Heaven, uh, so that's great to see. Um, the work of Elite and Agoriad, who provided first-class employment support um, for participants over the years, um, and the National Centre of Mental Health through Cardiff Uni for the evaluation. Uh, and again, I think looking at the, uh, what was captured so clearly in the evaluation, some really powerful results that have come through here. Um, but I also want to mention the All Wales People First Network, who I know have been involved over the years. And um, I was lucky enough to meet Geraint a good few years ago. And, uh, and when I found out I was seeing him again today, it was good to catch up. Because uh, uh, not someone you forget, that's fair to say, which is fantastic. So a really big congratulations both to Geraint, but to the broader network of ambassadors that have been a big part of this project. Um, so I'm... I was talking to Gemma this morning about, you know, why is, why is this project being successful? And um, I'm not going to attempt to go into every reason, but a few things stood out to me. I think the first one that's come across is you appear to have a really strong shared vision, values and agreed goals, and that there's a real clarity around that. And I think that's added to the success here. Um, one thing which is absolutely apparent with everyone I've spoken to about this project is commitment and passion. Um, and commitment and passion that I know many of you and also parents have in terms of supporting young people as they go into employment. <clears throat> Effective, regular communication and actually a sort of honesty in that communication. Um, and the final point I make is I know over the last eight years they have been perhaps the most disrupted eight years that we've had in society for some time. So the ability to adapt through a coronavirus a pandemic, uh, adapt the project to meet the needs and meet the voice of young people who have fed into this has been absolutely essential. Um, looking forward, I'm um, really pleased to, to hear some of the key lessons learned. And, and at the moment, we're developing a scheme um, that will lead on for this one around supported employment. Um, and you'll be delighted to know that as part of that, uh, we're going to be insisting on job coaches as being a, a part of that. So we're very much trying to pick up the learning from this project ourselves as we go forward. Um, so really, that just leaves me to say uh, it's been a delight to see such a successful project over the last eight to ten years. Fantastic to meet people who have benefited from the projects and see the enormous difference it's made. Um, so a big thank you to you all and big thank you to you inviting for me to come along and say a few words today. Thank you very much. Hi, okay, where's John? It's really nice to see you um, again um, after it's been quite some time, actually. But it was great to see you again. Thank you for coming along. Right, um, we have another and the last of the project's legacy videos. We showed the one earlier, and we're going to show you another one now. And after the video is finished, I will explain to you how and where you can access the videos. I hope you enjoy. Jock and Vow. Well, I did never think that I could get a, a job. But every other person I, I've asked, they've always said no, because they just look at me, they don't give me an opportunity. So that's why I'm glad that RCT took, the council basically took me on. My job here at Cerebra is a library assistant. I help sending out membership details to our clients, cleaning sensory toys when they return, and send books out to members as well. Before I came to Cerebra, I was working at a cafe in a bowling alley. I enjoyed it, but I don't think it's autistic friendly. When COVID hit, I was not myself. 
I decided I need to work because I need to keep busy. So I eventually spoke with my advisor through Engage to Change whether the job opportunity came up and she found the job at Cerebra with me and I got to do apprenticeship with it and I took it. Dwi yn ymchwilydd o fewn Tynopolis ac hefyd rydw i yn hoffi mynd allan ar leoliad i ddysgu sut mae bod teoli llen y camerau yn gweithio ond rydw i'n edrych ymlaen nhw anhefyd i'n symud ymlaen yn y dyfodol at gwneud chydig o gyfaswyddo hefyd. Engage to Change helped me to get the job. I have had help from my job coach to have helped me to apply to my work placement. She visited me every week to see on how I was doing. She was very reassuring to make sure that I felt relaxed in a very busy environment. I have a brilliant part-time job that gives me just everything that I need. Good hour pay, friendly people, and the accessibility to feel more included with everyone else. Since I became part of Team Cerebra, I've developed so many skills. Skills of confidence, as well as communication, and IT skills as well. And I'm more aware on data protection, and I've got great support, and become friends with um, all my colleagues here. There's good days and bad days, but most of them are good. It's like, I, wa I won't look back now. There's only one way, and that's up. Well, I see me the Chagwish of a Tinopolis of a Tokunta, we would kill the skis it magwish your mounts with when a Havan oiv. The bid Munilai, Bithanasa in Vath, I'm a hin heavied and as with da with your mounts with the bar, or his with the Hingahikal Hadigo Hebluck with well now with your heavied. Mae'n hydyri wedi gwella lot o hedwyd fel bys yn siaradus rydw i teimlo fel bod gyna i hydyrd siarad gyda pobl ar y ffôn ac wrth goesawu pawb i mewn yn y swyddfa, ond dwi hefyd yn teimlo fel bod gyna i hydyrd i ddweud fel petai os yna rhywbeth yn poeni fi neu os y gwaith weithiau yn dieddol oedd yn chydig bach yn osmo, dwi'n mynd. Gefnogaeth gyda'i un tywniaeth ych ymodd hefyd mae o yn help ddim ond, dwi'n mynd, ond i unrhyw un arall hefyd sydd efallai eisiau cael profiad o fewn i gael insight ac i trio Hoff peth o fewn, beth maen nhw eisiau gwneud, er mwy neu ddyn nhw allu gwneud penderfyniad uddfed wedyn, os hynna ydyn nhw gwneud fel swydd parhaol efallai rhyw ddwsnod yn y penderaw. If you would like to see more of these Project Logacy videos shown today, Learning Disability Wales staff will hand you a card with a QR code on them. Scan the code so you can watch them as and when you can. Right, I'm going to be here for another half hour now, giving all my, my thanks. I would like to thank Vaughan Gethin, who is the Minister for Economy, for sponsoring today's event, and thank all the speakers for presenting to us this afternoon, including Andrew Kenvin, Dr Stephen Bayer, John Rose UBE and Dr. Heaven David. Also, a big thank you to the Learning Disability Wales training and events team. Without their clearly led management, this event would not have been possible. Also, I would like to thank them um, for asking me to chair this afternoon. They probably wish they had a death wish, but there we are. Um, hope you all enjoyed and got something out of today's event, hopefully. Um, I should have mentioned this in the beginning. I am autistic. Um, I was diagnosed since I was 12. I have always had a motto, which is A is not for autism, A is for achievement. And this project has proven no matter what you've got, what label society sees us, whatever you can, any support you have, you can achieve anything. And the project has shown that for the last eight years. 
There is lunch being provided at the back of the hall, so please stay and network if you are able to. Lastly, I would like to thank you all for attending and safe journey home. If you're French, bon voyage. Thank you for attending once again. Jacques and Vowell. <laughs>